can we just give a hats off and a round of applause to the staff at Maggiano's? They do such a great job. And I don't know about that flatbread, but that's new and it was good. Um, we are missing our CEO, Dan Gibbons, but he does send his best to everyone. So a couple of people were asking where Dan is. Um, he's taking care of some family business, but he'll be back amongst us. Um, thank you to just a few folk. Pastor James Meeks was here. I don't know where he went, but he's here. Cause And it was good to see Dan Hines, who we know has kept a lot of the wheels running you know, for the state of Illinois. Um, there are a few other people at the head table. Mr. Lester Barclay, who is the board chair of CTA, David Doig, and Cheryl Thomas, and Aaron Edelman, and Marilyn. We have so many people here today. It's so great. Um, I guess you all want to hear what President Carter has to say. And this is his seventh appearance at City Club. So that speaks to his commitment. And there are only a few who have a few more numbers than he does um, of, of appearances at City Club. So we are grateful to him for being here. Mr. Carter was appointed to CTA presidency in 2015. He oversees more than 10,000 employees. Under Mayors Emanuel, Lightfoot, and Len Lightfoot, President Carter has overseen more than eight billion dollars of projects completed. Yeah, that's worth a round of applause, right? If you have questions, please make sure that you write them down and our, our wonderful City Club staff will make sure that they get them up to us. We will try our best to get everything in. I understand that Mr. Carter has a full schedule for us in his presentation. We welcome back to City Club for a seventh time, lucky number seven, Mr. Dorval Carter. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Oh, I want to thank you all for um, inviting me to be here. I want to thank City Club for giving me this opportunity. Um, I didn't realize it had been seven times until you mentioned it, uh, Jackie, but uh, I guess I keep doing something right because you keep asking me to come back. Um, you know, I. I want to say on behalf of the Chicago Transit Board, and particularly on behalf of my chairman, Lester Barkley, who's here with me today, um, thank you all for inviting me to speak. Before I start, though, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge a, a tragic incident that happened uh, on the Chicago Transit Authority just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, we had a mass killing, a shooting on CTA, in which four people tragically lost their lives. Um, what you may not know, is that literally the next day we had a CTA employee who got shot um, while standing outside of his car right outside one of our facilities. And so I don't need to tell everyone in this room that the gun violence that we deal with here is, is certainly unnecessary and tragic. Uh, and it certainly impacts CTA customers as well as our CTA employee and family in, in ways that I can't even begin to express. But I felt it was appropriate for me to at least acknowledge that uh, here today before I begin my remarks. And certainly, um, we continue to work closely with the mayor and with the city council to find ways to address these issues as we go forward. <clears throat> so, um, as someone who has a 40-year public transportation, uh, who is a 40-year public transportation veteran, most of that time is CTA. I have seen our industry change in some tremendous ways. Today's mobility landscape is an exciting one for the public transit industry for many reasons. The most obvious being our collective passion for innovation and the introduction of new technology tools that are improving customers' travel experiences at agencies across the globe. But look closely and you will see that the most successful transit agencies are also finding new ways to improve the frequency and the reliability of services while keeping a close eye on customer needs as it relates to cleanliness and safety. Maintaining a balance of these four elements is critical to any world-class transit system. As simple as this sounds, though, it's neither easy nor cheap to deliver upon daily. 
That's why I, along with many of my public transit colleagues, nationally and abroad, are creating a new vision for what public transit can be now and in the future. This afternoon, I'd like for you to join me for an examination of CTA's past, our present, and my vision for what a bright and sustainable future of Chicago public transit looks like. It is an ambitious vision, but with buy-in from the public, a solid commitment from elected officials, and significant investment into public transit for the benefit of our current and future customers, and for the great city of Chicago, we can make it a reality. In general, I believe most people view CTA as a buses and trains agency that gets people from point A to point B every day. That's fair mm -hmm. and a reasonable basic description of what we do. But it's also an oversimplification and a dangerously reductive description of the value of the public transit services that we provide. We are continuing to bounce back from a pandemic that hit our industry unusually hard. Today, CTA provides over 1 million rides each weekday with nearly 1,900 buses and 1,500 rail cars transporting customers across a service area with 146 rail stations and more than 10,600 bus stops. In fact, no single public service in Chicago touches many, as many individuals personally every day as CTA does. By contrast, the City of Chicago's Streets and Sanitation Department collects garbage from 600,000 customers each week. Oh, thank you. Yep, I'll probably need that at some point. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Chicago Public Libraries serve about 13,000 visitors each day. About 323,000 students are enrolled in Chicago Public Schools, and the Chicago Park District facilities welcome about 100,000 visitors per day. And things are continuing to improve at CTA. As of August 31st, CTA has employed 3,873 bus operators, which on a full-time equivalent basis is more than we had pre-pandemic and more than 400 more than we had this time last year. We have successfully trained 135 rail operating employees this year, and our rail workforce is almost 10% higher than it was just this time last year. We also continue to improve our service delivery in the month of August. We filed more than 98%, we, filed, we filled more than 98% of our scheduled bus service, and we delivered more than 95% of our scheduled rail service. And on the blue line, there were more than 25% added weekday trips on a daily basis since last August. So things are improving. Across our agency, many key performance indicators are trending positively, and we are excited about delivering those results for our customers. CTA's mission reads, we deliver quality affordable transit services that link people, jobs, and communities. And we deliver on that mission. But in some ways, the gap between what people want and deserve and what we provide isn't getting any smaller. We must have a conversation about who benefits from transit investments and what it takes to close that gap. And that conversation must happen now. So who are those people? I want everyone to take a moment and picture a CTA customer. Just take five seconds. So here's a surprise for you. No matter who you pictured, you're right. Our customer base is diverse in every way imaginable, without regard to gender, ethnicity, neighborhood, or any other factor. But I'd like to put a finer point on exactly who we serve and why transit equity must be top of mind for everything that we do. First, our riders are considerably more racially and socioeconomically diverse than the region as a whole. While 58% of Cook County residents identify as white, only 40% of our riders do. And across the board, we are slightly more concentrated among riders of color in all race and ethnic groups. Considering income, our riders are almost two times more skewed 
towards households that make $50,000 a year or less. And those statistics are even more concentrated when you look at our bus system, where 71% of riders say they primarily ride the bus are identifying as black, and bus riders' median income are only half that of those who ride rail. Unsurprisingly, our riders are also the ones that are most likely to need public transit. In 2021, the Regional Transportation Authority released a report entitled Sustaining Critical Transit. This report identified areas where public transit is most critical for accessing essential jobs, goods, and services, including areas where families are unlikely to have a car, area where jobs require workers on site, and areas where low income and younger commuters live, among other factors. Unsurprisingly, the vast majority fall within CTA service area. But our riders are more than just statistics. They are people. People like moms, dads, grandparents, and caregivers who rely upon our buses and trains to get their children to the babysitter, daycare, or school, and to get to work. People who live without cars, whether it's because they are unable to afford a vehicle, they are making a conscious choice to reduce their carbon footprint, they like the money and time savings of taking transit, or they simply believe in the value of transit as a public good. Employees in our hospitals, distribution centers, bars and restaurants, and countless other late night jobs who rely on our owl service to get them home every day. There are also people with disabilities, seniors and students who rely upon public transit as their primary mode of travel to get around the Chicago region. It is also every business in the city who needs vibrant public transit. Business owners and leaders rely on public transit for their employees to access their jobs, customers to connect to their stores, and the roads to have less car traffic so their, so their shipments can arrive on time. Of course, these are just a few examples of the riders who choose CTA. Downtown visitors, young people who cannot yet drive, and so many more, there is no limit to who may need to ride CTA for a day or for a lifetime. And we are very proud to serve all of them. That pride is reflected in the 10,000 plus hardworking men and women that make up CTA's family of employees, a group of dedicated transit professionals that take great pride in moving our customers across Chicago and the 35 suburbs that we serve. Speaking of our dedicated workforce, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize their recent achievements when the eyes of the nation were looking upon our city. The Democratic National Convention ended on August 22nd, and by nearly any objective standard, it was a tremendous success. I want you to know that I am very proud of the CJ personnel who did such a great job supporting the DNC while maintaining great service throughout the entire city and while providing more than 100 special delegate buses to support the DNC convention itself. We were proud to represent the city on that week. And I can tell you that every one of our employees stood tall at the fact that we could show off one of the best transit systems in the country. Leading the charge during the special occasion and all others that occurred throughout the year, of course, is my dedicated executive leadership team. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge them as they're here today. You guys, raise your hands. They're kind of shy and don't want you to know who they are. But let me just say this. Um, the things that you see me talk about and the things you see me do are a direct result of a management team that I believe is on par with any that we could have in this country. And I'm very proud to have all of them working for me and working for CTA. CTA is not only an agency that supports Chicago's economy, but we're also a jobs engine ourselves. Beyond the people that we employ directly, we are creating contract and job opportunities on CTA capital projects. By participating in CT programs, small and disadvantaged business enterprises have earned more than one billion dollars in contract awards since the beginning of my tenure at CTA. For too long, 
these companies were locked out of opportunities because of racial discrimination from the previous decades. And for that, I'm happy to have been able to rectify it to some degree. On the workforce side, we have helped create careers for low-income workers, union apprentices, and residents of economically disadvantaged areas who have earned over $52 million just from 2022 through May of this year. Our capital projects pay dividends to the local economy, both during construction and once they are implemented. The Red Line Extension Project, which may be something you guys have heard me talk about before, is estimated to generate more than 25,000 jobs throughout Cook County in the coming years. During the pandemic, our workers were discussed as essential employees, which could not have been more appropriate. When the world shut down, so many of them showed up and helped us continue to address our most transit-reliant customers' travel needs. Their jobs are often hard and sometimes thankless, but we support them 24-7, have regular conversations with union leadership outside of contract negotiations to keep lines of communication open, and know, and I certainly will say this, without them, there simply is no CTA. In fact, I want, to, I want to recognize one of the union leaders that's here with us today, uh, Mr. Keith Hill, who's president of ATU 241, which represents our bus employees unions, one of the largest unions in our, in our agency. Keith, thank you for your continued support of your members, our employees, and CTA. <laughs> Coming out of COVID, which rocked the entire public transit industry, CTA, like others, saw disruption to our service and our workforce that were, impo that were impossible to predict. While I'm happy to say that we're solidly on the right track and ridership and hiring continues to grow at a rapid pace, we didn't go into COVID on a solid financial foundation. And unless we unmask that reality, we will never get past it. We owe it to those riders and our employees to deliver a world-class experience, and in fact, and in fact, the fact of the matter is we fall short, in large part due to a significant funding disparity for CTA. The service our employees provide every day makes up 84% of the public transit service provided in the Chicago region. Mm -hmm. Let me repeat that number. CTA provides 84% of all public transit service provided to customers riding buses and trains throughout the entire Chicago region. You may be surprised or even find it curious to learn that CTA receives only 46% of the funding. 84% of the rides, 46% of the funding allocation. Of course, Metro and Pace are the other service boards in our region and we do enjoy a great working relationship with both of them. And we certainly respect the valuable services that they provide. And this is not intended to, dis to, to degenerate their needs as part of this bigger conversation. Um, but I think it's important to point out a few distinctions between their subsidies and CTAs. And here are some facts for you to consider. Metro is budgeted at about $13.94 per ride, while CTA receives approximately $3.79 per ride. Within the Chicago metropolitan area, the CTA receives about four times less funding per trip than either Metro and Pace. The Regional Transportation Authority receives $270 million, or 11% of the state funding, before any service board receives a single dollar to provide service. If you compare this to our national peers, the CTA ranks second to last in funding received per trip provided in 2022, which is the most recent year that we can make a comparison. Finally, according to the Census Bureau, the CTA has the second highest base of low-income commuters in the country even larger than Los Angeles, California. We cannot expect to have a world-class transit until we have an honest discussion about the dire need to change 
how transit is funded and prioritized in our region. Anything less is a disservice to our customers and threatens the economic future of our entire region. I'm going to provide you with a really brief primer on how CTA is currently funded, known as our funding formula, which was established more than 40 years ago. I promise to make it brief, but I think it's important for you to understand how we got here, because if we don't understand our past, we're doomed to repeat it. The year was 1983. To put that in context, it was the same year as the last episode of MASH. <laughs> it was the year Motorola introduced the first commercially available mobile phone. Sally Ride became the first American woman in space. Yes. And the CTA, one year away from opening the Blue Line expansion to O'Hare Airport, delivered over 1.6 million rides each weekday. That same year, the state of Illinois enacted a funding formula for public transit that was never envisioned to properly fund CTA, and by extension, our riders. It was never designed to be responsive to the transit service needs of our region, and it was, in fact, a political band-aid. In theory, the formula should provide discretionary funds for the Regional Transportation Authority that would allow it to engage in decisions about how public transit services are operated and provide a sufficient and sustained funding source to support the provision of those services. In practice, however, the formula has never provided enough funding to support CTA's operation at the level necessary to deliver our mission of economic mobility and connecting people, places, and communities. And in fact, the discretionary funds that were supposed to be used by RTA to improve our services, 98% of that money had to go to CTA just to continue our day-to-day -day operations. In later years, stories were told that revealed the thoughtlessness and lack of consideration of important factors during the creation of this formula. In 2004, former Chicago Tribune transportation reporter John Hilkovich wrote a little, brought a little attention that was paid to claims or talked about the little attention that was paid to claims about ridership, service performance, and other operating criteria when the formula was created. He then quoted Kirk Brown, who was the former state transportation secretary, who had been involved in creating the formula. Mr. Brown said that in 1983, there was no consideration of, quote, passenger miles or whatever, close quote. He noted, the primary concern was devising a formula that politicians could convince the city of Chicago and its suburbs was fair. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a great strategy for winding up with a funding formula that doesn't work. It didn't work then because it was a sham, a way to push a formula that lacked the necessary service considerations and any vision about the future or even basic flexibility that would allow for the formula to be adjusted to address future challenges. It should have been about serving people, serving our economy, serving our community, but what it's been about is passing the political football on deficits and responsibilities. Now, I've been in the public sector long enough. I am not naive to the politics of the past. But the politics of the past should not dictate outcomes for critical services over 40 years later. Today, CTA, Metro, and PACE are facing a post-pandemic fiscal cliff, an over $730 million combined budget shortfall expected in 2026 that is a direct result of inadequate state funding, further exacerbated by the ridership and revenue declines caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of you transit experts may know that there has been increased funding since 1983, and you aren't wrong. But many of those funding changes barely kept up with the cost of employee wages and pension payments, which required system-wide service cuts to afford. Since, 19, since the 1983 RTA Act, real per capita Illinois state transit funding has grown by 50%. By contrast, 
real capital transit funding grew by 74% in New York, 108% in Massachusetts, 127% in DC, and 152% in California. But funding is not the only story, and it would not be fair of me to suggest that. A change in Chicago's population, cars becoming more affordable, relatively cheap fuels, the introduction of rideshare, and work from home schedules have all had an impact on ridership. In the early 1960s, CTA served approximately 800 million riders. 800 million. That is on par with systems today like Madrid and Cairo. I'm sorry, Madrid and Berlin. But a transit system with ever diminishing funds was no match for a surge in affordability of car ownership and the massive subsidization of a roadway network to serve it. It's easy to forget now, but some of you may recall the doomsday CTA budgets of years past that saw service and manpower reduced due to recessionary budget shortfalls. This was particularly harmful in 2010, which is described in CTA's bus vision report. The bus vision report is an incredible document that discusses, examines, and considers CTA's bus system, past, present, and future. This unprecedented study is the first time that there has ever been a holistic look at CTA's entire bus system. And I would encourage each of you to read it. You can find it online at cta-bus-vision-project-dot.com. <laughs> you get all that? <laughs> or just go to our website and Google Bus Vision. You'll find it there. <laughs> That said, I want to be clear that our bus system network remains one of the most comprehensive in the world. It truly forms the foundation for how we are reimagining our service and considering our future. The images you see on this slide are from the Bus Vision Report, which explicitly show the reduction in CJ bus line frequency over a 12-year period. And the difference is very easy to see. The map on the left is from 2007, and the map on the right is from 2019. They reflect the effects of service cuts in 2010 and show without question that we've lost a great deal of bus service over time. And that loss of service, plus a few other compounding factors, directly translated into a 20% ridership loss over the decade. When frequency is cut, transit becomes less useful, and it's not surprising people stop taking it. And that wasn't the first time that our services have been cut due to an inadequate financial support. One of the biggest cuts that occurred was in 1997. The consulting firm of Booz Allen and Hamilton was hired to recommend a restructuring proposal for CTA with an eye towards producing cost savings. That report was adopted and massive cuts were made that were even deeper than those that were made in 2010. 15 bus routes were eliminated Evening aisle and weekend service was reduced on 24 of the 46 key bus routes due to low ridership, and five other routes were shortened during unproductive time periods. In addition, what you didn't see here are the ways millions of lives were altered and all the lost opportunities for jobs, connections, and education that undoubtedly contribute to our city segregation and other related disparities in wealth, public health outcomes, and certainly the impacts of violence on some of the city's most vulnerable communities. What is not shown up anywhere in this history lesson is the question of consolidation of agencies, which seems to be the most popular transit conversation for our region today. The reason that it is not shown up is that the structure of our agency and our boards has never been the problem. The number of boards and who sits on them has never had any control over how much funding gets allocated to highways, how affordable and accessible it is for many to buy a car, and I can guarantee you that our boards have never voted for service cuts out of a belief that reducing service is what is best for our riders. All these conversations about the consolidation of transit agencies have happened without considering the overall policy context including governance and funding of transportation. It fails to acknowledge decades of diminishing support for transit, 
which left northeastern Illinois transit agencies fighting over scraps and constantly being pitted against each other and other roadway users. And I am not alone in this belief. In fact, all regional transit agencies and many local elected officials have agreed that consolidation is not the answer to our current transit funding challenges. Internationally renowned public transit consultant Jared Walker, who worked on the bus vision study with us, recently discussed this issue in an article where he expressed opposition to the notion of agency consolidation. He cited the same rationale I've expressed for more than a year, including the reality that there are no economies of scale that arise from merging the agencies, and the fact that transit agencies in major cities have profoundly different transit needs and transit politics from those of their suburbs. A University of Illinois Chicago professor who also expressed a similar belief citing Walker's position and included equity concerns about the proposed elimination of the CTA and what that would mean in terms of loss of influence for Chicago, where public transit riders, as I indicated earlier, and black and Latino residents are mostly concentrated. So why all the fixation on governance? It's an easy pill to swallow, and it's a hell of a lot cheaper. It is much easier to say that bureaucracy is the problem. Let's rearrange a few things than to make tough decisions and take tough votes about raising revenue. It is much easier to present governance as a solution to transit challenges than taking a hard look at policy decisions made in the past. It's much easier to challenge an alleged mismanagement than to face the truth of decades-long discriminatory and racially charged funding policies. The unfortunate truth is that the current system for funding transit is tantamount to transit welfare. And that truly is a governance problem. Governance by the local, regional, and state leadership that could have and still can champion a transit system that will move us closer to the type of world-class transit system that we seek and that this region deserves. So to give you some examples of the kind of innovation and support for transit to which I believe we could aspire, I'd like to take a look at two of our international public transit peers. The two top European transit systems, Paris and London, both of whom have achieved world-class status. Anyone who's ever, who's ever taken a public transit to any, in, 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 in any of these cities has likely marveled at their frequency of service, the sheer number of people traveling along their system. Throughout the years, many residents of both cities have adopted transit as their primary mode of travel, a dynamic heavily influenced by their government's firm commitment to transit investment and dense, walkable development that prioritizes people. So how has that happened? Four factors have most powerfully impacted these agencies' ability to thrive. First, the systems were very positively impacted by elected officials and public transit leadership that encouraged transit innovation and transit prioritization at every level. Second, they are focused on service frequency and reliability. That is the bedrock of their service. Third, they invest heavily in growth and modernization. And fourth, these systems are always working to make improvements that allow them to meet every significant service demand. Of course, none of that would be possible without an adequate level of funding. Because they are well-funded and enjoy strong political and community support, both of these systems are willing to make the bold policy choices that make transit-oriented living the most convenient choice for residents and visitors alike. Choices from low emission zones, to car-free riverfronts, to congestion pricing. These cities govern for transit as part of the urban fabric. Today, these programs have resulted in reduced traffic and improved air quality for the areas that they cover. In addition, the revenue they generate is earmarked for significant transit investments to help support the system. Now, I want to be clear that neither Paris nor London's public transit systems are perfect. They both have their challenges and issues. But if I've, I have experienced both, and I have been impressed with the trilogy of qualities they both have that I believe all public transit agencies should seek to emulate. 
They're always working to meet the public transit needs of the communities that they serve. They address the needs of the community while seeking to improve the quality of their living environment. And they actually help to create the communities that they serve by both directly and indirectly through smart land use, good transit oriented development, and high quality of infrastructure investments. These systems are examples of what is possible when there is a vision for the future that is supported by elected leaders. They are admired and renowned worldwide because they have across the board buy-in regarding the importance of transit within their society, which reflects the support that you need to make their systems truly world-class. So this image is of a map that hangs in my office that reflects the CTA map in 1960s. Back then, as I indicated earlier, CTA provided over 800 million annual trips. This is 75% higher than what we served in 2019, and is the equivalent of what systems like Stockholm or Cairo currently serve today. There's a great deal of conversation about what people want in 2024 and beyond, but many of these, the people engaged in that discussion have no idea of what we've already lost. It's important to highlight the story of CTA's financial past for the public and to discuss our efforts to establish the building blocks today that can support our own quest to return to world-class service. And now, I'd like to talk to you about that future. I have a strong vision for the future of our agency that I would like to share with you. First, Moving forward means in some ways reestablishing world-class transit from past decades, getting back to the basics for what we've always done so well. We are reimagining our entire bus system in a way that we know is going to reflect the travel needs of current customers and future generation of riders in all parts of our service area. This includes establishing a frequent bus network, investing in over 40 routes at a minimum of eight minute frequencies, all day, every day. You can clap for that. <laughs> With that service, we can provide over 94% of Chicago residents an all day transit option within a short walk. Better service on weekends, midday, evenings, and overnight is what our customers are asking for and is what our 24 7 city deserves. Just as we're doing this with bus, we also need to realign our rail service with how people ride today. We still have strong morning and evening peak period ridership to the loop, but we also see more and more riders during the midday, evenings, overnight, and especially on the weekend. Just this last Saturday, we reached 90% of 2019 ridership retention, while our peak service and ridership retention is around 65%. We will take learnings from our national and international peers and deliver a frequent rail network all day, every day. That means five to six minutes all day across the system. That means improving our midday and evening service to come more often and even expanding our overnight service to the orange line, ensuring travelers and workers alike can access Midway Airport easily and quickly. We have to build on this investment with critical infrastructure improvements across our service from pursuing more bus priority on our streets to expanding connections across our rail network. Today, we have 10 miles of dedicated bus lanes. That is wholly inadequate for a world-class transit authority. By comparison, New York City has over 130 miles of dedicated bus lanes or HOV lanes. Los Angeles has over 100 miles of dedicated bus lanes. And even Columbus, Ohio has more bus lanes than Chicago, with 16 miles currently installed and another nine miles underway. To get to a world-class bus system, my vision is to create a platinum level bus rapid transit on 10 key corridors throughout the city. Our vision involves infrastructure improvements at key bus intersections and routes throughout the city, including queue jumps, bus bulbs, and dedicated bus lanes, and more, resulting in at least 20 miles of bus lanes created each year. 
CTA would also continue to research and test the latest technologies that will help improve our day-to-day -day operations, as well as employee and rider safety. This includes creating transit signal prioritization, active detection collision avoidance, and automated bus lane enforcement. It also includes charging forward on our full fleet bus electrification plan. The vision for rail is no less ambitious. We want to continue to build on our rail system like our global peers that have, that have not stopped building and prioritizing transit investments. We also need new stations across our rail network that take advantage of new population growth, close key gaps, and provide multimodal connections as we have with our Damon Green Line station. Along with adding new rail stations, we need to continue to invest in our stations with art from local artists, more benches and seating, better digital signage, and other customer amenities beyond transit, like bike parking, package pickup, and more. We want to increase the number of useful connections in our system and create crosstown networks throughout visionary ideas like the Mid-City Crosstown Connector, which some of you may know as the Circle Line, the West Loose Subway, the Green Line extensions to Midway and Jackson Park's future Obama Center, and a Brown Line connection to Jefferson Park. This will unlock new travel patterns and reduce multi-seat or multi-transfer rides for customers, especially riders on the west and south side. The Red Line extension is the largest project in CTA's history and will provide a faster connection from the far south side to the rest of the city. And while the Red Line extension is a visionary project for this region, and we should look to extend, we should look to expand, extend more rail lines to better connect the regional economy with extensions on the Forest Park branch and new connections for the Orange Line to Fort City, just to name a few. So, before everyone starts saying that this is impossible, let me note that we aren't that far behind our international peers. London's public transportation system, Transport for London, only has 20 more miles of rapid rail lines than Chicago. And I look forward to closing that gap in the coming years. My vision doesn't just involve investing in CTA service, it also involves investing in the connection points to our partners at Metro and Pace, as well as other modes like Divi. Of the busiest regional intercity rail stations worldwide, and even in North America, Union Station and Ogilvy Transportation Center are relatively unusual for not having direct connections to rail rapid transit. New York's Grand Central Terminal and Penn Station, Washington's Union Station, and even Denver's Union Station all feature more direct rail rapid transit connections. We need to invest in direct connections to our CTA rail lines at these key transportation centers. This should extend also to our neighbors, our neighborhoods. Earlier this month, we extended the Ashton Avenue bus route one mile to reach the Ravenswood Metro Station. We will look to do more of those connections in the future. Our rail stations and major bus transfer points should all come equipped with Divi bike docks and scooter parking. And yes, these connections also mean building on our venture system to launch new and innovative fare products like the Regional Connect Pass and the Regional Day Pass plus working with Metra and UIC to pilot expanding our UPASS program to now include not just CTA, but also Metra. We've already made significant down payments towards further fare integration, and with the launch of the Ventra system, we will look to further in integrate our fare passes and fare collection methods in this vision of the future. At CTA, we strive to be a part of the communities that we that, we, um, that are vibrant, safe, and easy to get around. The key to reaching that goal is to make choices that prioritize people and public transit in safe ways. To achieve that, a key focus of our ongoing policy advocacy includes supporting increased transit accessibility, as we have with our All-Station Accessibility Plan, which is CTA's blueprint to make all 146 of our rail stations accessible to individuals with physical disabilities by 2038. CTA will also seek to advocate for policies that prioritize transit and help reduce emissions 
like a dynamic congestion pricing plan in Chicago, and vehicle electrification. CJ's rail system was fully electric decades before that became a popular policy. So we are environmentally friendly. These are all visionary ideas that mirror continued discussion and progress, but they must be done by a transit agency that is not cut off at the knees or suggesting as pie in the sky just because there's a belief that there's not enough return on that investment. In fact, there is. At CJ September board meeting, we provided our board with a new report from Argonne National Laboratory regarding the future of transit in Chicago. The report focuses on transit expansion and discusses how transit investment can and will impact Chicago region in the future. The report assesses the benefits of increased funding and other reasonably transit-friendly modifications, like zoning changes, bus lanes, and speed policy, initiatives actually under discussion by legislators today. Among Argonne's findings was that investments in regional transit service would create 13 times the return in value in household and travel time savings, plus $19 billion in additional economic value every year. In addition, researchers found that a robust investment in transit service would result in a 53% increase in transit boardings across the three service boards with a 9% travel time savings across all modes, including cars, and an 11% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. To say it simply, investing in transit benefits everyone, including those who don't take it. It is possible, but it requires a new approach, a stronger, better sort of campaign to get people out of their cars and into CTA vehicles. But it will only be successful with legislative support. And so, you might be wondering, OK, fine, Dorval, what do you want? <laughs> I want to extend an invitation. We invite the state legislatures to join us to advance a vision of the best future possible for public transit. Our customer base is made up of their constituents, and we all want the best possible transit services for the people we serve. What makes this different is that we're not looking for a bailout. We are seeking to execute a vision for transit that prioritizes equity, sustainability, and mobility. That is part of a much larger public policy discussion that looks seriously at the factors that influence our ridership. My request to Springfield is simple. You've done visionary things in Illinois in the past. Transit should be your next big visionary act. To address the challenges transit faces, difficult choices will have to be made, including those that take poor people and other transit-dependent people into account. In addition, we should recognize the elephant in the room, that funding transit properly will involve asking individuals with resources to help fund a service they don't use in the interest of a public good. But we must think differently and think bigger. The future of public transit in Chicago requires an examination and expansion of areas like equitable transit-oriented development, land use, bus rapid transit, and significant infrastructure modernization and improving investments. That's how we get to world class. This is about choices. If we say that we collectively want better air quality, improved traffic congestion, dedicated bike lanes, and other improvements that CTA can impact, we need our leaders to lean into transformational change, not incremental improvements. That's how you get world class. CTA's system already features state-of-the-art facilities, like our multimodal 95th Street station. But for that to continue, we need our elected officials to join us as we seek to sustain that progress through innovation, modernization, and a rethinking of how public transit is funded and supported in the Chicago area. That's how you get world class. And we can get world class, but we only have to do it together. Thank you. Thank you, Darvel. 
I guess your folks didn't want, they didn't trust our water down here? I don't know, you know. <laughs> We did have water for you. You can have a seat if you want. We're going to go through a couple of questions. Okay. First, let me um, correct myself. For, I guess someone, um, thank you, um, the folks at Everett, for letting me know. Apparently, I said the CIA was here. <laughs> <laughs> the CIA I was, hope not. The CIA is not here. It is CAI. Where are you all in the room? They're somewhere here. Sorry, you guys. Girls, why didn't you say something? Um, thank you, Mr. Carter. Uh, there is so much to go over, and we only have a few questions, um, which I'm very surprised. Are you bringing me more questions? Okay, well then we have to move quickly. Um, there was so much there, uh, I almost don't know where to start, because CTA is vital to everything that we do. I always ask this question, how many people ride public transportation? That's a good show of hands, right? That is. How many of those people are loyal CTA riders? That's good. RTA? Oh. <laughs> and Pace. RTA doesn't have any. I meant oh. Metra. I meant Metra. I meant Metra. You know what I meant. <laughs> so we have a good number of folks here who are um, socially conscious and want to make sure we're doing what we can do. Um, I do know that on the days when I am uh, on the expressway, I do notice more traffic, but I don't see as many folks, you know, on the green line, and I, it kind of makes me sad, because I like my days on the green line. Um, we have a few questions. This one is from Joe Donegan. Are you here, Joe? He's not, oh, you are, okay. Good, because I'm not like Dan. I will not ask your question if you're not here. That's not true. I will sometimes answer them. His question is, what expansions to the L would be required to truly bring Chicago's transit to the same level as peer cities such as Paris? I know you touched on it, but. Well, I, you're right. I think one of the maps that I put up during my presentation showed the expansions that we believe would start to do that. One of the things that I've learned from, from um, talking to officials at both Paris and London is that they are looking more and more at creating what I would call concentric circles that tie together their lines and allow people to move in a direction other than in and out of the central business district. One of the good things about the CTA is that our basic infrastructure is top notch. Our rail system is very good at getting people in and out of downtown Chicago. It, it has you know, spines off of it that cover just about every part of the entire Chicagoland area. What you can't do is get around from one side of the city to the other without going into downtown Chicago first and going back out. So the Circle Line and other connectors like the Brown Line um, uh, to the Blue Line and others are intended to create the type of concentric circle that allows you to move more easily, not only between one side of the city to the other, but with the interconnectivity that we can create with Metro and Pace, to move more easily throughout the entire Chicagoland region. See. Well, last week or week before last, we had um, Fritz Kegi and come talk about um, tax assessments. And this week, we're talking about CTA. My brain literally hurts <laughs> just from the, it does. I mean, just because this stuff is so tough. You know, we are the city that works. We are the greatest city in the world, right? Undoubtedly. Um, but the stuff that we have to go through, thank goodness we have good people there. Um, the next question is from Diane Hansen. Diane, where are you? Okay, she's here because she wrote her question. Does the CTA plan to reinstate the Elston Avenue bus or is it up to Mayor Johnson? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it says. Well, let me just say the mayor always has a say in a lot of the things CTA does. Um, I mentioned earlier the bus vision study that CTA is undertaking. Um, there is a, a community engagement portion of that study that we are just now beginning that is intended to look at our entire bus system. Believe it or not, CTA has been around for 75 years. We have never taken a look at our entire bus system to see if it's really serving the needs of the customers that, that we're trying to, to uh, provide transportation services to. And so 
I am sure that that particular issue will come up as a part of the broader conversation around what the future of our bus system should look like. But I want to repeat the point that I made earlier. I have no doubt at the end of this study, I'm going to have a whole lot more requests than I don't have the money to pay for. And that gets back to my earlier point about this doesn't happen without the funding that we need to make it happen. Selfishly, as long as you all don't touch my number 20 going that way. <laughs> Tom Cotterick from the Civic Committee. <laughs> he is here. Um, and Tom is a member, thank you. If the Illinois General Assembly made one public policy change to help transit in Chicago region, what would you want that change to be? I know you talked about that a little bit. Wow. Um, and he's he trying says, to, He's trying to hold me to one. Well, he says, <laughs> he goes on to say, and the answer can't be more money. <laughs> Just a softball, you know. Well, how about um, creating policies that tend to encourage the use of public transportation over single occupancy vehicles. There's a broad range of stuff in there. But when you, when you, look, at, when you look at a lot of the world-class cities and their transit systems, they didn't achieve their ridership levels totally by themselves. Yeah. They achieved it in, in partnership with the type of public policy um, uh, decisions that drove people to use public transit. Mm -hmm. um, that was connected to, because I'm not going to let you get away with I can't talk about funding. That is connected to, obviously, creating the type of transit system that people would want to use, which required more funding. But if you combine those two together, you have the recipe for a world-class transit system. Mr. Carter is a lifelong transit guy. Is that right? Lifelong? Yeah. Much? Yeah. And I, I, you know, when you have expertise, um, you don't take it for granted. So I think Chicago is fortunate. Illinois is fortunate to have his 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 brain power. And um, yeah, that's tough stuff. I don't. I didn't, I didn't get the website, but um, just Google it. <laughs> CTA Bus Vision. It'll pop right up. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we're all going to do some light reading and go home and, and better understand what, what we've got to deal with at CTA. Uh, we can't thank you enough, and we can't wait for number eight to come <laughs> up. Um, you are more than welcome to come back. I think we've got some conversations that we'd like to hear with RTA, Metro, Pace, CTA, everybody combined. Would you like to hear something like that? Yeah. 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 We'll see if we can. We'll see if we can make that happen. Um, thank you to everyone who is here. We've gone just a little bit over time, but I certainly think it was well worth the um, time to, to hear what Mr. Carter had to say. So thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank you, CTA. Thank you to the staff that was humble and didn't want to stand up. And um, we are adjourned. Thank you so much. <laughs>